Mary said, I'm Francis and I work at the University of Dundee in Scotland. First of all, can everybody hear me at the back there, okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I've just put a little note here at the bottom to remind me to say that there's a couple of posters at the back along where the, the tables are, um, showing some of the work that I'm also going to present in the, the talk here. So you can go and have a look at those as well during the breaks if you want. Um, so Peter is, has spoken a bit about the clinical features of PC. I'm going to talk a bit more about the genetics. And then, as Peter already mentioned, this is a staining of a keratin cell. And Gabrielle, who's talking after me, is going to talk a little bit more about keratins. So as we know, PC is a rare genetic skin disorder. And genetic disorders are caused by mutations in different genes, which you can really think of as genetic spelling mistakes. In the case of PC, we're looking in particular at, at keratin genes. So briefly during my talk, I'm going to break it down into the, the genes that we're looking at and what they do, how PC is inherited, and how we do the genetic di diagnosis in the lab. So basically what we do with the saliva or blood samples um, when you send them to Dundee. So firstly, what are genes? Well, a gene is a region of DNA that makes a particular protein. So in the case of PC, we're, look at, we're looking at some of the, the keratin genes. So if we have a mistake in one of these genes, it makes it a faulty protein. In this case, faulty keratin genes. So as Peter has given us a, a brief introduction to keratins, um, but there are many different keratins, at least 54 that we know of, and these are structural proteins. And keratins are found in particular in cells in the skin, hair, and nails. So these are the, the tissues that are affected by your PC. We know that, that there are at least 22 keratin um, genes that are associated with different human disorders. So PC is really belongs to a family of, of disorders due to uh, mutations in different keratin genes. And all, all of these result in some form of cell fragility, which leads to blistering and overgrowth thickening of the skin of the affected cells. So Peter has already briefly mentioned, but I'm just going to show these similar pictures again. That's what we can see when we look at cells in the lab that have mutations. So here again we have, these are cells, so some of you have had biopsies taken maybe from your, your skin, and in the lab we can grow these cells in culture and then look at them in more detail. So if we stain them with particular stains to the keratins, we see this nice network of filaments, whereas if there is an abnormality or a mutation in one of these cells, then we get this keratin clumping and very few filaments, and this is what gives rise to the fragile cells. So for PC in particular, we're looking at um, five keratin genes. Keratin 6A, 6B, 16, and 17 have been known to cause PC for a number of years now. More recently, during the last few years, um, with completion of the human gene, sequencing of the human genome, it was confirmed that there was a third keratin 6 gene, keratin 6C, and we've now looked at this gene in a number of families where we didn't find mutations in the other genes that we knew were associated with PC, and have found mutations in, in keratin 6C. So far, we've only found mutations in, four, in three families, and another group has identified a fourth family. In these families, it appears that clinically, um, the phenotype, the, the clinical condition looks slightly milder, but the patients still suffer from severe pain in the feet. Um, but the numbers are very small so far, so we expect that we may find further families with mutations in keratin 6C. These pictures are all familiar to you of what clinically um, you see with mutations in 6A, B, 16 or 17. In comparison to those that we know so far have mutations in keratin 6C, which appear to be milder, but again still have the, the pain associated with the keratoderma. So moving now on to how PC is inherited. PC is known as an orthosomal dominant disorder, and there are many, many different orthosomal dominant disorders. Um, some of you will may have been told that you're a, a spontaneous um, case, in which case you're the first person in the family to have the disorder, whereas others you, you'll know that maybe one of your parents has PC, your grandparents, one of your grandparents, um, cousins, uncles, etc., and that's a familial case. Here we see that what we, if we, sorry, if we draw the pedigree out, this is a typical orthosomal dominant pedigree, where the squares represent a male, circles represent female, and if they're shaded in, that's an affected person. 
So you can see that both males and females are affected. You get a number of affected people within each generation, or in this case, um, neither child was affected. Here we have a spontaneous mutation which can be either male or female. So in terms of how the, genes, how the disorders are inherited, with a dominant disorder, each person has one normal copy of the gene and one mutant copy of the gene. So every time they have a child, there's a 50-50 chance of passing on a mutant gene. So the risk is the same for each pregnancy. So for example, you could have three affected children, and then the risk for the next, next child born is still 50-50. So you could go on and have a, a fourth affected child, or it may be an unaffected child. Or you could have two unaffected, then one, of, one affected, one unaffected. But the risk for each, each pregnancy is 50-50. And there's no sex bias, so males and females are, are equally affected. So if we go back to this picture of the pedigree, we can see in this first here, this, this couple here, the female was affected, mother was affected. They went on to have four, four children. Um, of the three boys, two were affected, and then their daughter was also affected. When the son here had two children, neither of these children were affected. So in this this part of the family, then when these children have, have, go on to have children, they won't be affected, so there'll be no more PC in, in that part of the, the pedigree. But in this part of the family, here this, this daughter has got PC, so if she has children, then each time she has a child, there's a 50-50 chance of, of having another affected child. So now moving on to the genetic diagnosis of PC and how we look for these single spelling mistakes within one of the keratin genes. So most of you, I think, have probably sent um, blood or saliva samples for genetic testing, and these are sent to the lab in Dundee, where we extract the DNA. So the DNA contains all of our genes, and then we're specifically interested in looking at the, the keratin sips A, B, C, 16 or 17 genes. And we do this by DNA sequencing. So we, once we've extracted the DNA, we take a very small amount of this, this DNA and then amplify it up to make lots of the particular genes that we're interested in so we can examine them in more detail. I've just got a few slides to show you the types of equipment that we use in the lab and the very small volumes of the samples that we deal with. So this is a... Um, just to show you that we're dealing with tiny, tiny volumes, and it's shown in blue here just to, to color it so you can see it. Um, but the, the volumes we deal with are, are like the size of a, the end of a, a pen, really. Um, and then so we, we set up lots of reactions. We have lots of tubes, as you can see in, in the rack, racks here, um, to amplify up each, each different gene. These then go into these special machines here to heat and cool them make lots of it and this takes several hours and many of the bits of equipment that we use in the lab are very specialized they look very boring because they're just kind of square square boxes but there's a lot of, um, that are worth lots of money but they're very specialized and do very specific specific things so during this reaction it will make a lot of the say k6 or 6a or 6b gene and then we do a further round of reactions to do the actual dna sequencing this is Neil sitting in his bench here in the lab. He's the guy who actually does all the, does all the genetic testing. And you can see various bits of equipment. This is a sort of typical lab bench with, with different things that he's using here. This is a, a DNA sequencing machine. So the samples are loaded onto this machine. And then we get a printout which shows us your actual DNA trace. And that's what we look at to look for the, the <coughs> genetic spelling mistake. So on the computer screen, we see a, a printout like this, lots of, lots of different colors, basically. And then each one of these tracks represents one of our sequencing reactions. From this, we can't really, really tell anything. So then we get a further printout here. And we get several of these for each of the genes that we're, we're looking at. And then if we zoom in and look at this in more detail, we can decode the, the DNA sequence. So on these, these DNA sequence traces, this gives us the, the DNA sequence. And this is color coded really just for ease of reading for us. And as I mentioned before, the, um, you have two copies of the gene. 
So in this printout, this represents both copies. So here we've got two copies in each of these peaks. And if they're the same, then they're, they're superimposed on top of each other, so you just see it as one peak. And so we're really looking for, for differences in these traces, as shown here. So this is the sort of thing we're looking at. So we look through pages of these things for each gene, looking for differences that we might find, such as this where you've got two peaks on top of each other. And then really what we have to do is, is decode it and see whether it's actually going to make a change um, to the specific gene that we're looking at and whether where the mutation is would cause would be disruptive to the function of that particular gene. So this four-letter DNA code spells out, spelling, uh, spells out instructions to make the protein sequence. And you don't really need to worry about this too much, but I'm just going through it a bit in detail because I know you, you've all been given your specific mutations and you maybe wonder what this, what this actually means. So we, we have a, a, a DNA sequence which is then decoded to give us the protein sequence which is represented by these, these three letter words here. So basically, we if we find a change in the DNA sequence, we need to see whether it changes the actual protein sequence. So it would be like if you think of a spelling mistake, say the word cat, if you change the C so it became mat, then that would be your, your genetics um, mutation. So really, if you think of the, the gene maybe as a chapter in a book, and you're just looking for one spelling mistake within that chapter, And then, depending on how the, what the word that's changed is, how it changes the context of that sentence or where it is within that chapter, would maybe determine how much the, the keratin function is changed. Because we have many changes within all our genes that don't actually give us any, any disorder, and we can tolerate those. But in certain proteins, for example, as in the keratins, where the mutation occurs, um, will really affect the function of the protein and then that's what gives rise to a clinical condition. So for example here, if this AAC becomes AAG, then that actually changes the, the protein from a, what's known as a sphagene to, to a lysine. So I'll just go through a couple of examples of these, as I know that you, most of you I think already know your mutation. So for example, if you're told it's K6A PE leucine 46 8 proline, <coughs> what does that actually mean? Well, the first bit, the, the K6A, is, is the keratin 6A gene, or it could be K16, K17, K6B, so that's the gene that's involved. The P just stands for the protein. The leucine is your amino acid, and the, the amino acids can be represented either by their full name, by a three letter um, abbreviation, or just by a single letter abbreviation. And this, this, this can be slightly confusing. Um, and so it's a leucine that's been changed to a proline. And at the, the DNA level here, that's the, it changes from a, a CTG to a, a CCG. And then the position of the amino acid within the keratin protein is, is number 468. And I'll show this in a, in a slide in a minute. Some of you maybe have a different type of mutation where maybe one amino acid has actually been deleted or inserted. Um, and this is represented here. So again, the, the K6A is the K6A gene. The, the amino acid, or the protein amino acid that's been changed is the asparagine. And the DEL stands for deletion, and it's number 172 that's been deleted. Here we have a, a schematic diagram of, of a, a keratin. And it's divided into different regions. And there's been a number of studies over the years um, looking at different regions and what their function might be and how, they are, how important they are in cells and giving the cells uh, the, the structure that they need. And we know now that the, the red, what I've marked in red at either end of the, here, at the rod domain, these regions are particularly important um, when filaments form and to, during the, for the structure. And so if you have a change within one of these regions, then this will be particularly disruptive to the, the nice network of filaments that we see. And this is in fact where most of the, the PC mutations occur, as shown here. So 172, so if you think of this as the, the protein sequence, and it's just numbered one to, it's, it's about 500. So most of you, either your mutations are probably around 100 and something, or 400 and something. And that's because they occur in these regions here. 
and we know these are, are very important regions for the functioning of the filaments. So if you have a mutation here, then that causes collapse of your scaffolding, resulting in the fragile cells. And so these are the regions that we call the hotspot regions. And they, these are the regions that we screen for mutations first. If we don't find a, a mutation within one of these regions, then we go on to fully sequence all the rest of all the five genes that are associated with PC. In some cases, we still don't manage to find a mutation, and so then we have to consider other disorders that clinically look very similar to PC, but are caused by mutations in, in several other genes. This schematic diagram here shows all the mutations that we've identified in PC families that are registered with PC Project. So now we have more than 75 different keratin mutations. And here we see the percentage with the different, in, within the different genes. So we can see that nearly 50% of the mutations are found in keratin 6A, about a quarter in keratin 16, a bit less than a quarter in keratin 17, about an eighth in um, keratin 6B, K6C, we only have actually one family registered with PC Project. The, others, the other three families aren't actually registered with PC Project at the moment. And we have a number of families in which we still haven't been able to find a mutation. Um, some of these look slightly different um, clinically from, from typical PC. Um, and, and this trend of the, almost half the mutations occurring in K6A and about a quarter in 16 and 17 seems to be fairly consistent as we increase the number of families that we're looking at we still seem to see this, this general trend. So I'd just like to end there. This is the picture of Dundee taken across the, the River Tay. Um, we're based in this, this white block here. This is a huge complex um, life sciences building. Um, now actually if you go to Dundee, you don't see this, the skyline change dramatically um, last weekend when these, there's, a, there's another tower block here. These four tower blocks were um, demolished in a spectacular explosion. I mean, it was planned. It was the old ones that are coming down. But if you look on the BBC website, you can see them all come down in one go. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you won't be able to take a picture like that any longer. <laughs> and uh, can I have to take questions now, or we can do it at the end of the session, whatever is easiest. Do you want to just carry on, Mary?